Welcome to Zoom Palestine while I uh, put on the music for today. Uh, it's Nizar, Nizar Aboud uh, performing at the UN. Anything does express your feeling. We are trying to be a human being, a normal musician in an abnormal situation. Maybe our success was when Mahmoud Darwish teach me not to be a Palestinian musician, but to be a musician from Palestine and to recognize the identity of the culture and to try sometimes at least to understand it. Thank you very much. Welcome, uh, Jaju. This is Nizar Aboud at the UN. <laughs> Thank you. 
so wonderful. Um, welcome on Facebook, uh, Joshua. I'm sorry uh, to subject you to me. I sent out an email inviting people and I forgot to put the link in. Um, I've been a little uh, discombobulated um, at the present moment uh, of time in, um, uh, let's see if I can get myself here together. Um, yeah, I um, have had a, a little bit of a setback in doing Zoom Palestine, but um, hopefully back uh, again today. I don't know if you can see um, the, my screen, um, but anyhow, hopefully other people will join on Zoom. Uh, and then I make a, um, a video of the uh, session and send it out to people anyway, so uh, people can watch it, you know, at their leisure. And I uh, certainly apologize for the snafu. Um, today, we're going to talk about um, how uh, uh, poetry uh, in Palestine has inevitably been a tool, uh, has been um, about resistance, because that's the existential situation of the Palestinians now under occupation. And um, the, uh, in Arab culture, poetry is um, uh, a natural part of their lives. Everybody knows poems, everybody writes poems, everybody recites poems. So poetry is um, a very large, important part of Palestinian existence. Uh, I'm not sure why my face is so, um, where the light is coming from. Oh, I think that I'm getting light from the window is coming in. So let me turn on my light here, that might help, yeah. So uh, that, um, that uh, in order to uh, understand the role of poetry in resistance, you have to understand the role of poetry in Palestinian culture. And this very much comes from the um, memorization recital of the Quran, which is basically a long poem uh, written uh, in, in poetic form. So people memorize the Quran um, and uh, as young children and uh, that um, they develop uh, very good memories. Um, for words. And that skill uh, is an extremely important part of Palestinian culture. So that people have amazing abilities to memorize. And I was uh, shocked when I was teaching my students and I would grade their exam papers and it was like almost word for word from the book and I was convinced they were cheating. And then I realized that they have phenomenal memories for words, that words uh, are a very important part, and the use of words are an extremely important part of Arab culture, similar to as it serves in England, where poetry uh, is memorized by children at a young age, and, and every British person can recite poem after poem, uh, as opposed to Americans who can't remember anything, <laughs> memorize their memories are, are not terribly uh, cultivated. So um, whatever is an issue, in, um, in their lives is immediately translated into poetry. And I told this story once before, and I'll tell it again, that uh, I went to a wonderful party with my dear artist friend, Hilda Hiati, and uh, um, it was to uh, eat a special fish imported by truck uh, uh, in a couple at night uh, from, a, from the uh, Tigris or Euphrates River, I forget which river. Um, and it was a bunch of artists uh, gathered together uh, drinking arak, which is that wonderful um, kind of licorice uh, type um, drink from uh, Lebanon made from flowers, uh, very expensive. Um, we had a very expensive bottle that we were finishing off pretty quickly. And uh, at one point, everybody stopped at the party and said, okay, let's let's say poetry, and one person just immediately recited a poem and everyone went, gala, gala, wonderful. And we, they went around and everybody had to recite a poem. And a lot of them had a poet poem tucked in their pocket. They'd pull out their latest poem that they wrote. Or uh, some of them were uh, reciting um, ancient Arabic poetry, uh, Iraqi poetry, uh, particularly because a lot of them were Iraqi refugees. And um, uh, and then they came to me and I felt like an idiot because I really didn't know 
very many poems and um, I recited something, I don't remember, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright or something like that. But from then on, I always, whenever I went to a gathering, I'd always have in my pocket or purse some poem, uh, something I wrote or something somebody else wrote to be prepared. Uh, because poetry is, is just part of the conversation. Um, you talk to people in words, but also in poetry. So uh, the uh, role of uh, poetry for resistance is great. And um, it's part of their very basic life. Now, uh, I, I have to confess um, why I was uh, delayed this morning. I was very upset, uh, a little depressed last night about doing Zoom Palestine. I received an email from a friend of mine whom I'm having a little bit of a tiff with right now, uh, but somebody who I thought was very understanding and supportive. And she said to remove her from the uh, mailing list for Zoom Palestine because of my vitriol uh, on the issue. And I'm thinking like, you know, is passion for people's uh, injustice, for injustice being called to people, is this vitriol? Is it wrong to be passionate about um, about people, people being uh, uh, killed, harassed, having their homes stolen, being beaten, tortured, thrown in prison, children um, being de denied their childhoods, thrown in prison, uh, land being stolen, um, bigotry, apartheid. Even this week, Amnesty International declared Israel an apartheid state. So is it vitriol for me to bring this to um, the attention of people to talk about it, uh, to analyze it, to be in solidarity with Palestine, struggling Palestinians. I was very upset that uh, people would see my passion uh, for justice as vitriol. And I truly apologize uh, if anything I have said um, or done during these sessions um, makes people uncomfortable. It makes people feel that I'm being vitriolic, that I'm being harsh, that I'm being unfair, that I'm being vindictive and mean and nasty, which is what vitriol implies. So I truly apologize to everyone if I've ever done that. Um, but I'm just trying to uh, follow my conscience, which is uh, telling me I must speak out for the injustice of Palestine. And I speak out for lots of injustices. Anybody who knows me is I'm always reading the paper and I complain about what's going on in Tigray, what's going on in Yemen, what's going on in our country, um, what's happening in China. Uh, there, there are many parts in India now with, uh, as uh, uh, Jajul, as you know, with the, the uh, extremist right growing in India. I'm very concerned about that, particularly since my son-in-law's family is from India, so my grandchildren are part Indian. Uh, and uh, the, we, we treasure and value Indian culture and our family. Um, but I'm terrified about what's going on with the far right and particularly with the abuse of women. I have a granddaughter and India now has been declared to be the most dangerous country in the world for women. Uh, and I don't know if you've read the recent story about the married woman um, who was um, beaten by mobs and raped and everything uh, uh, just, just, uh, just I think yesterday. So um, we have many things to um, complain about, but I have, since I lived in Jordan and I spent a lot of time uh, in Palestine and Israel, excuse me, I'm particularly passionate about Palestine uh, because I think Palestine is not given notice in the press and there's a big cover up in this country. Whereas this country will talk about all the other issues I mentioned, they don't talk much about Palestine. But that's changing, thank God. So hopefully we will be part of the, the uh, change in the world. And here's a beautiful poem uh, that talks about how poetry Teaches Life by Rafe uh, Ziada. Um, this was written around the time of the Gaza bombing. So let's uh, 
let's uh, listen to this poem to start out our session. Ah, here we go. This beautiful video. Starts with this poem. I wrote this poem when the bombs were dropping on Gaza, and I was the media spokesperson for the coalition, uh, doing a lot of the organizing. And we had stayed up at six o'clock in the morning, me, perfecting every sound again. bite. And by the we end, can hear it. Okay. I'll start with this poem. I wrote this poem when the bombs were dropping on Gaza, and I was the media spokesperson for the coalition, uh, doing a lot of the organizing. And we had stayed up to about six o'clock in the morning, perfecting every sound bite. And by the end, if you're Palestinian, you know most Palestinians get tired and start pronouncing our P's as B's. So we become Palestinians by the end of the day. So I was practicing my P's all night. And the next morning, um, one of the journalists asked me, don't you think it would all be fine if you just stop teaching your children to hate? Um, I did not insult the person. I was very polite. Uh, but I wrote this poem uh, as a response to these types of questions we Palestinians always get. Today, my body was a TV'd massacre. Today, my body was a TV'd massacre that had to fit into sound bites and word limits. Today, my body was a TV'd massacre that had to fit into sound bites and word limits, filled enough with statistics to counter measured response. And I perfected my English and I learned my UN resolutions. But still, he asked me, Ms. Ziada, don't you think everything would be resolved if you would just stop teaching so much hatred to your children? Pause. I look inside of me for strength to be patient, but patience is not at the tip of my tongue as the bombs drop over Gaza. Patience has just escaped me. Pause. Smile. We teach life, sir. Rafif, remember to smile. Pause. We teach life, sir. We Palestinians teach life after they have occupied the last sky. We teach life after they have built their settlements and apartheid walls after the last skies. We teach life, sir. But today, my body was a TV massacre made to fit into sound bites and word limits. And just give us a story, a human story. You see, this is not political. We just want to tell people about you and your people. So give us a, a human story. Don't mention that word apartheid and occupation. This is not political. You have to help me as a journalist to help you tell your story, which is not a political story. Today, my body was a TV massacre. How about you give us a story of a woman in Gaza who needs medication? How about you? Do you have enough bone broken limbs to cover the sun? Hand me over your dead and give me the list of their names in 1,200 word limits. Today, my body was a TV'd massacre made to fit into sound bites and word limits and move those that are desensitized to terrorist blood. But they felt sorry. They felt sorry for the cattle over Gaza. So I give them UN resolutions and statistics, and we condemn and we deplore and we reject. And these are not two equal sides, occupier and occupied, and 100 dead, 200 dead, and 1,000 dead. And between that war crime and massacre, I vent out words and smile, not exotic, smile, not terrorist and I recount I recount a hundred dead 200 dead a thousand dead is anyone out there will anyone listen I wish I could wail over their bodies I wish I could just run barefoot in every refugee camp and hold every child cover their ears so they wouldn't have to hear the sound of bombing for the rest of their life the way I do today my body was a TV massacre and let me just tell you there is nothing your UN resolutions have ever done about this and no soundbite no soundbite i come up with no matter how good my english gets no soundbite no soundbite no soundbite no soundbite will bring them back to life no soundbite will fix this we teach life sir we teach life sir we palestinians wake up every morning to teach the rest of the world life sir <sighs> Wow. 
Wow, how powerful is that? So uh, welcome, uh, Gufran Ansari, also to Zoom Palestine, joining us uh, today. Uh, things a little uh, um, uh, off uh, uh, schedule uh, since I forgot to send out the Zoom link to everybody when I told them about the session. And I had to stop um, and send it out. Uh, I was just, um, the week has been very cold and bitter. We've had ice storms and uh, today, and uh, I, I just I just wasn't focused this morning. Um, anyhow, uh, Wes, so welcome. And we're gonna be talking about uh, the role of uh, resistance in poetry and how uh, important poetry is as part of uh, Palestinian culture. And we have, um, hi, Jean-Bierre Lim, welcome. So glad you're here. Uh, sorry about the mix up. Uh, so we started out uh, with the UN uh, where, with that beautiful um, uh, um, concert uh, by uh, Aboud, uh, who was playing the Oud. Very, very beautiful. And we're um, going to be uh, listening to some other um, sessions, some other people talking about their, uh, uh, their poetry and how their poetry is part of resistance. But you know, every morning, every time uh, we begin these sessions, I begin with uh, uh, catching up on the news. So we are all, um, hopefully you're on the screen share and you can see. So uh, the first thing I want to start with is our electronic intifada, um, which uh, talks about in the camp of despair, a life rooted in love, uh, birds surrounding, uh, surrounds borders and barriers at Badia's tree. Um, so let's read a little something uh, positive. We try to read both positive and negative news. Just reading the negative stuff is just too depressing. And we have to realize that good will triumph. And um, we're reading about uh, Fadia's tree it is a culmination of more than 10 years of work by a pair of unlikely friends, Sarah Beddington and Fadia Lubani. Beddington is a visual artist who grew up in rural England and was privately educated. Fadia is the mother of two children who was widowed at 19 and lives in Borj al Jaini refugee camp on the outskirts of Beirut, Lebanon, where she runs a kindergarten. Early scenes in the film show Fadia sitting under a scrawny, dusty tree in a cramped courtyard in the, in the camp. It is hardly a place of respite in a camp where wires and cables hang in heavy bundles throughout the alleyways, barely more than a meter wide. The feeling of enclosure is palpable, yet Fadia smiles. This is where she comes to find calm, to find peace by the tree. Burj al Barajni was established in 1949 to provide temporary shelter for 3,500 Palestinian refugees. Four days later, during the war of the camps, Burj al Barajni was blockaded and besieged by forces from Amal, a Shia political grouping backed by Syria. Residents starved and conditions were brutal. At least 40,000 people, including many refugees from Syria, lived in overcrowded camp and conditions remained desperate. This film, so it's an interview, a review of the film, opens with a big view of the sea, waves lapping as the canvas awnings flap in the breeze. Sarah narrates in the first person, I am sitting in a cafe when a woman leaned across and asked, are you happy? And so she met Fadia Lubani. Fadia's family was forced to flee the village of Sasa in northern Palestine in 1948. Her big dream is to return to her village to see their house on the hill and the tree that grows by the Eastern Gate. Fadia asked Sarah to make a film and to find her tree. Sarah is doubtful that she could do either. 300 hours of footage later, something exquisite and profound is achieved. Fadia's tree unfolds simply as a dialogue between two women who share an inherent love of nature and a deep sense of justice and fairness. Cautious and polite with an accent and nationality imbued with all the associates of empire, Sarah is unseen in the film and determinedly so. She reveals Fadia to us with respect and sensitivity. Fadia's personality makes this film what it is. She's been forced to make choices 
that a heroine in Greek tragedy would shy away from is keeping her children with her and jeopardizing their future or letting them leave and risking never seeing them again. Though Fadia, the viewer, through Fadia, the viewer feels a deep, almost spiritual communication with birds, trees, the sun, and the moon. This is felt more accurately when contrasted against the dull and imprisoned atmosphere of the refugee camp. Fadia's tree unsettles the audience by guiding them how to look, how to pace themselves, how to appreciate what is valid, humane, beautiful, and true, without ever making the viewer feel they are being preached to. Birds and trees score the film like the lines on the etched glass of Bennington's artworks, but here nature is far from static. The force of the birds' migratory superhighway that crosses borders and checkpoints beats through the, throughout the film. Imagery of avian migration is juxtaposed against footage of Palestinian laborers climbing over the railings of checkpoints to get to work. Wherever walls and blockades of resented people, nature and animals surmount, resist, and try to wear them down. How wonderful. What a, uh, a really uh, wonderful uh, image. So Fadia's film, another film that we should see, and I'll see if I can uh, perhaps show it to us um, because uh, we need to feel hope. And another victory is a Palestinian teacher uh, defeats Israel lobby smears. Uh, this is another piece of good news um, that in uh, Sheffield Hellam University has dropped an investigation of Shahad Abu Salama, an activist and assistant lecturer who was falsely accused by Israel lobby groups of anti-Jewish bigotry. Abu Salama was offered a more secure contract to the university, which is north of England. She has resumed teaching her classes. The university suspended Abu Salama from her position on January 20th amid a smear campaign by supporters of Israel. Administrators launched an investigation following a complaint over her social media posts, which criticized Israel and its state ideology um, of Zionism. But following a massive support campaign and public outcry, the university reinstated her on 27th of July. And we know um, that this is a, a very common uh, practice of uh, university professors, including myself, getting in trouble for uh, their uh, uh, resistance and their, their, um, their speaking out against Israeli apartheid. Um, and there's another article on Electronic Intifada, if you haven't seen it, came out, this version came out at four o'clock this morning, uh, which talks about Palestinian um, resistance is forcing, oops, women, forcing liberals uh, to see Israeli apartheid and uh, um, uh, talks about other articles, Gaza's farmers struggling for livelihood um, and a podcast, episode 50, Israel's dirty arm trade secrets uh, and what makes Amnesty's apartheid report different and Israel's smears against Amnesty failed to hide apartheid. Uh, so and we're gonna read a little more about um, the Amnesty uh, International Report because we're gonna look uh, at um, the um, uh, a very interesting, uh, wonderful uh, website, the Palestinian Project on a Facebook page. So I, if you're not sure, if you haven't looked at the Palestinian Project, this is a very important uh, web page. Um, and, uh, and we have the death of an inconvenienced Palestinian and it really, Andrew Mitrovica writes, for once the ugly death of a Palestinian got big play in some US media only because he was an American. Usually dead Palestinians do not, as you and I know, merit that kind of, of attention. Um, and then uh, they write about the uh, um, Amnesty International reports. So I'm gonna read this because this was a very important event this week that Amnesty International finally came out and joined Beth Salam and other organizations declaring um, Israel an apartheid state. Now let's see what they say. Amnesty International has become the third major human rights organization <clears throat> to accuse Israel of committing the crime of apartheid against Palestinians in a new report released on Tuesday. 
Amnesty finds Israel's system of apartheid dates back to the country's founding in 1948 and has materialized in abuses, including massive seizures of Palestinian land and property, unlawful killings, forcible transfer, drastic movement restrictions, and the denial of nationality and citizenship to Palestinians, all of which constitutes apartheid under international law. We speak with Amnesty International USA's executive director, Paul O'Brien, who calls on the United States to put pressure on this system of apartheid, despite both the Biden administration and the Israeli government um, reporting, uh, uh, rejecting the report's findings. So let's have a look at this YouTube, um, because this, this is, is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman, joined by Democracy Now! co-host, Nermeen Sheikh. Hi, Nermeen. Hi, Amy, and welcome to our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Amnesty International, the world's largest human rights organization, has for the first time accused Israel of committing the crime of apartheid against Palestinians. Amnesty becomes the third major human rights group to decry Israel's apartheid system over the past year, joining Human Rights Watch and the Israeli group B'Tselem. In its report, Amnesty says the roots of the apartheid system date back to Israel's founding in 1948. Amnesty unveiled their findings and occupied East Jerusalem on Tuesday. This is Amnesty's Secretary General, Agnès Calamard. We are here today to call on the international community to take resolute action against the crime of humanity being perpetrated in order to maintain the system of apartheid. The Biden administration has joined the Israeli government in rejecting Amnesty's findings. Israel called the report false and biased. The U.S. ambassador to Israel called the report absurd. In a moment, we'll be joined by Paul O'Brien, the executive director of Amnesty International USA. But first, we turn to an excerpt of a new video produced by Amnesty. When you hear the word apartheid, what do you think of? Probably the disturbing images of racial segregation between whites and blacks in South Africa, where a regime ruled by a racist white minority declared themselves officially superior to the black majority, then proceeded to dominate them. South Africa's apartheid system officially ended in the mid-1990s, but that doesn't mean apartheid can't happen elsewhere. Here, in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories, Palestinians are being forced off their land and out of their homes, separated and segregated by laws, walls, and checkpoints. They live in a constant state of fear and insecurity and deliberately impoverished. While, on the other hand, Israeli authorities have given given the Jewish Israeli population privilege over Palestinians in just about every facet of life. The question is, does this all amount to the crime of apartheid? First, the definition of apartheid. The crime against humanity of apartheid is perpetrated when particular serious human rights violations are committed with the purpose of establishing and maintaining a system of domination by one racial group over another and systematically oppressing them. But does this system exist in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories? And there's been a growing debate about whether the situation in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories is apartheid. And now is the time for us as the world's largest human rights organization to offer up our analysis. Our findings and criticism are directed not at the Jewish people, but at the Israeli state. It's the Israeli state that put in place the policies that implement the laws and the practices that oppress Palestinians. That was Amnesty International's Philip Luther. Amnesty video goes on to detail a history of the Israeli state, then document how Israel has implemented its apartheid system today. One way to understand this segregation and oppression is to look at the ID system. Jewish Israelis have only one ID card with a status that grants them the right to live almost anywhere they wish in the country. They can move freely with access to health care and vast resources. Palestinians, on the other hand, have four types of ID cards, if any at all. 
that the kind of ID card you are given determines the level of rights you can enjoy and controls where you can go and what you can do. If you hold a green card, you are subject to military rule. And if you have a green card with a Gaza address, it means you're trapped in a 365 kilometer square open air prison under Israeli military blockade in place since 2007. Israel controls what goes in and what goes out from children's toys to medical supplies. 90% of the people have no access to safe drinking water, 47% are unemployed, 56% live in poverty. Palestinians with a Gaza ID are forbidden from going to Jerusalem in the West Bank, even if they have family there. Some people in the West Bank are considered to live there illegally and can be deported immediately to Gaza if found by the army, even if they have been in the West Bank for decades. Whereas, if you hold a green card which has a West Bank address, then you live here. This green card means you can live within specific enclaves surrounded by illegal Israeli settlements. And there's a separation wall and fences built around you since 2002, which Palestinians call the apartheid wall. It's eight meters high in places and 700 kilometers long. That's twice the height of the Berlin Wall and more than four times its length. 80% of it is built inside the West Bank, occupying even more Palestinian land. There are separate roads for Israelis and Palestinians, hundreds of checkpoints scattered throughout, not to mention the 54 years of occupation, which has devastated the lives of millions of Palestinians. Palestinians with a West Bank ID can travel to Gaza or East Jerusalem, but only if they receive a permit from the military to do so. This blue ID is for Palestinians in East Jerusalem. They can travel to the occupied West Bank as well as to Israel, but they are not citizens of Israel. They have only been granted a residency status. This means that they cannot vote in Israeli national elections, and if they leave East Jerusalem for too long, for example, to study or work abroad or in other parts of the occupied West Bank, their residency is revoked, so they can't return. Since 1967, Israel has revoked the residency status of more than 14,600 Palestinians from East Jerusalem. If this complex ID system wasn't enough to segregate the Palestinian community, in 2002, Israel introduced a law that prohibits family unification. That's right, denying Palestinians the right to live with their loved ones if their ID cards are different. And this woman is one of thousands of Palestinians who Israel will not issue any ID card. She can't travel, can't hug her family, only see them meters away across the border. Putting down roots, the family home, these are crucial parts of what make a strong community. To make sure Palestinian communities can't develop any further, Israel has made it almost impossible to grant building permits for Palestinian homes. So, Palestinians live in a catch-22 situation. In order to have shelter to develop their communities, they must build without a permit. And if they do so, Israel can demolish the structures on the basis that it was built without a permit. Right now, there are over 150,000 Palestinians currently living under the constant threat of demolition and forced eviction, many of them for the second or third time. In the West Bank, an average of 18 Palestinian structures were demolished every week in 2020. The same year, Israel issued 1,094 building permits for Jewish applicants and only one for a Palestinian. This goes back to the heart of the issue. To maintain the state's character as Jewish, Israel systematically disadvantages Palestinians while privileging Jewish Israelis. This racist privilege has been enshrined in laws, policies, and practices, and it enables Palestinian resources to be taken in order to economically benefit Jewish Israeli citizens. Amnesty International and other rights organizations have been documenting patterns of human rights violations and international crimes for decades. These are the most visible and violent part of this system. At the end of May 2020, 4,236 Palestinians were held in Israeli prisons. 352, including two children, were held without charge or trial. 
between September 2000 and February 2017, Israeli forces killed 4,868 Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territories, including 1,793 children, outside the context of armed conflict. And Amnesty International is not aware of any case in which an Israeli soldier has been convicted of willfully causing the death of a Palestinian in the occupied territories since 1987. This imbalance of rights, justice and accountability is never more clear than when a Jewish Israeli life appears to have more value than a Palestinian's. Israel's apartheid and its cruel and prolonged strategies deliberately disadvantage Palestinians wherever they live. They cannot claim to enjoy equality with Jewish Israelis. That's an excerpt of a video produced by Amnesty International, released this week along with a major report accusing Israel of committing the crime of apartheid against Palestinians. The Biden administration's rejected Amnesty's findings. On Tuesday, State Department spokesperson Ned Price was questioned by Associated Press journalist Matthew Lee about Biden administration's criticism of the Amnesty report. Yeah, it may be true that you don't offer public comprehensive evaluations of outside reports, but you certainly cite them quite a bit uh, in your own human rights report. And I went back and looked and, you know, in terms of uh, just the last human rights report cited Amnesty International on Ethiopia, on Cuba, on China and Xinjiang, on Iran, on Burma, on Syria, on Cuba. And that those references... Uh, are endorsements of what the this group, Amnesty, and then other groups as well that are cited as well, have found. Why is it that without taking a stand or, or making a judgment about uh, the findings of this particular report, why is it that all, all, all criticism of Israel is from these groups is is almost always rejected by the U.S. and yet accepted, welcomed, and endorsed? When it comes when it, well, when it comes out when the criticism is is of other countries, notably countries with which you have significant policy differences. Matt, I would make a couple points. Number one, when we include a footnote in something like these are footnotes, Ned. These are when we these are, when we these when are we cite when we cite, cite yes. which uh, it's a game of semantics, I suppose. But whether you call it a citation or a footnote, well, when it says in the report, Amnesty International found this X yes. in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs. And we th and 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 we determine that we we think that it's a genocide, and you guys come out and so cite that and say, well, we also agree that it's a that genocide. is a far cry, Matt. From I, saying, I'm not from saying, saying that we thing, have but comprehensive agreement with a third so party report so that was produced just, by an so outside group. When, so it's just when it's criticism of Israel that you feel free to d disagree. Where where have you ever disagreed with an amnesty report or a human rights report on a country such as Iran? This or, is not, uh, Matt. China? This is this is not about any outside group. Uh, this is about our vehement disagreement with a certain finding in a report by an outside group. That's State Department spokesperson Ned Price being questioned by the AP reporter Matthew Lee. We're joined now by Paul O'Brien, the executive director of Amnesty International USA, who's just returned from a trip to Israel and the occupied territories. If you could respond to the U.S. rejection of this report, along with the state of Israel, and also the significance of this multi-year project that Amnesty International has just released. Thanks, Amy. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for your coverage. Um, you're right. It's taken us four years. Uh, the report itself is 280 pages long. And because we are a human rights organization, not a political organization, it focuses on what is the international law now and what is the evidence on the ground through hundreds of interviews and looking in depth at laws, policies and practices. Is this international legal standard met? This administration has already said, and these are their precise words, that Israelis and Palestinians should enjoy equal measures of freedom, security, prosperity, and democracy. In our view, as a human rights organization, the only way that Israels and Palestinians can enjoy precisely what this administration has said is to dismantle the system of oppression and domination that currently exists now. You can't get there any other way. I think, frankly, that what this administration is responding to 
is the word and not the legal analysis and not the evidence on the ground. Paul, explain uh, why Amnesty came to the decision to call it apartheid now. Well, firstly, why apartheid? People, I think it is a, a, a word that emerges from a particular socio-political history, as our video shows, but it also became in 1965 an international legal standard um, enshrined in the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which the United Nation States signed, which Israel signed. Uh, it was then defined further in two other documents, the Apartheid Convention and the Rome Statute. It has particular elements. What we have done is to take a look at that international legal standard, that crime against humanity that is now enshrined in human rights, and, and, and compare the evidence that we found on the ground to that, um, that legal standard. And we found with respect to every element, is it a system of oppression and domination? Yes. Are there widespread uh, crimes uh, uh, that are inhumane or inhuman? Yes. Does it lead to one racial group being oppressed and dominated by another? Yes. Is there an intent to maintain that system of domination and oppression? Yes. And so across all of these areas of rights violations, um, we found the crime of apartheid to be in place. Why now? It took us a long time to do the research. We build off the work of so many Palestinian organizations that have been asking for this legal analysis, frankly, for more than a decade. As you said, we build off the work of other human rights organizations. We wanted to get it done as soon as possible because the fragmentation, the expulsion, the dispossession of land and property, the deprivation of economic and social rights, it's ongoing and we need it to stop. And it won't stop without a serious conversation in these United States around what this country can do to put pressure on the Israeli government to dismantle this system of apartheid. And Paul, how do you respond to those who say, uh, even if it is the case that uh, there is a system of apartheid in place uh, in Israel vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, uh, that a similar argument could be made uh, with respect to China's treatment of its Muslim uh, uh, minority, in particular in, in Xinjiang? And, and China Amnesty has done a lot of work in China. We've documented extensively structural deprivations of rights in Xinjiang, and we've done it elsewhere. We've applied the standard of apartheid elsewhere. In 2017, we applied it in Myanmar um, because that's what we found was being experienced by the Rohingya people. It's an international legal standard. We haven't applied it everywhere that it could possibly be found. I hope that we will, but um, based on the calls of Palestinian activists that have been going on for decades, on the human rights work of other groups that have already documented it. There is uh, a human rights conversation now going on around whether apartheid exists in Israel, in the occupied Palestinian territories, and we add our human rights voice to that discussion. When you put out your report, you took a series of questions. One of them was, does Amnesty oppose Israel's military occupation of Palestine? Your response, Paul O'Brien. We don't take a position on political issues, Amy. We don't take a position on the two-state solution, on the one-state solution. We are an organization that maintains our credibility by focusing on human rights standards and the evidence that supports them. Is it the case that the occupation that is ongoing has led to systemic human rights abuses? It is absolutely. I was in Gaza on my last overseas work trip. I witnessed many of the things that you saw. I saw the restriction of movement. I saw the deprivation of economic and social rights and the failure to get even basic services. I've been in Hebron a number of times. I was in Ramallah last week. I see the checkpoints that we have to go through when we visit the West Bank. It is absolutely the case that the occupation is leading to systemic human rights violations. That's where our focus is.
Paul O'Brien, I want to thank you for being with us, Executive Director of Amnesty International USA. We'll link to Amnesty's new report, Israel's Apartheid Against Palestinians, a Cruel System of Domination and a Crime Against Humanity, and to the full video that accompanies it. When we come back, we go to Moscow to look at the crisis in Ukraine. Stay with us. Wow. <clears throat> that was unbelievable. So what is the response of poets in Palestine to uh, what is going on. Let's listen to uh, an interview. Um, this was an interview uh, um, during the Gaza war. So let's listen to this. This is how poets respond. First, we go to our correspondent, Huda Abdel Hamid, who was in Gaza City. She's been covering the protests along the border of Israel and Gaza. You at home can join our conversation via Twitter at AJ Stream or through our YouTube chat room. Huda, welcome to the stream. Israeli forces have killed at least 52 Palestinians. That's the, the latest death toll of those protesting in Gaza along the border. They fired live ammunition, tear gas, firebombs. What was it like witnessing the events of today? It was actually uh, surreal, if I may use that word, uh, simply that because we were standing there looking at the protesters. Yes, the Israelis had warned that they will have a zero tolerance, warning people to keep away uh, from uh, the border fence, but they really started shooting very early uh, in the morning, even when there were many protesters and they were just burning tires uh, not very far from the fence. Yes, but they were not trying to reach that fence. And then throughout the day, we just saw one ambulance after the other. It was a continuous uh, stream. We even at a certain point moved away from the border fence and went to one of these first eight uh, tents. And it was relentless for the medical staff there. And now they have these tents uh, to, sort of, to sort of make a triage of um, you know, the injured who need to go to the hospital because they're in bad conditions and want those who can be treated on the spot simply because the medical uh, system here in Gaza is crumbling. Just a few weeks ago, it had already uh, declared a state of, of emergency. So it was tough, difficult. Mm -hmm. The youth were there defiant. Uh, resilient and you know you would look at them some of them were so young and you could see in their face that you know this fear their fearlessness the fact that they didn't mind if they were going to get wounded or if they were going to die was just a sign of how desperate they they are mm. I, I pulled up this tweet here uh, that we got from a former uh, stream guest this is Omar Qaraib who says hearing updates while we are on our way to donate blood it's surreal. I feel numb. So many people killed and injured here today. You can smell death in the air. The streets are empty and Gaza is sad. Can you relate to what Omar is writing here in his tweet? Yes, absolutely. It was very sad, especially when you go uh, to, to these medical tents. And I've been, I, I've covered the protests at the beginning, the first two weeks. And when you went to hospitals, I mean, it was a lot to take in. It was, sometimes it felt like someone had just punched you in the stomach. All these young people maimed. Uh, some of them had their leg amputated simply because they are in Gaza. If they were somewhere else, they could have gotten the treatment they wanted. If it wasn't that they were in Gaza and things were so complicated, they might have been able to travel to Egypt or to the occupied West Bank to get treatment there but they are in Gaza and they have no way out. And I remember very well one doctor talking to me um, and he was very emotional. He was containing his tears. And he said, sometimes I feel helpless. These people should not be suffering so much because the degree of injury they have is yes, very uh, serious, but it could be treated if Gaza was a normal place. Mm -hmm. But And then he said, but this is not a normal place. 
and he was really struggling it up. He did not know what to do. Mm. I, I want to share a visual um, example of that juxtaposition that you're talking about. That this is because these people are in Gaza, and if they were someplace else, they might have been able to get more help. This is uh, Patrick Gailey, who an AFP photographer, and he shares two photos from the AFP uh, posted today, May 14th. Left Jerusalem, right Gaza. Pictures taken at the same time this afternoon, and on the right-hand side, you see protesters, one passed out, uh, and, and people carrying him in Gaza. On the left-hand side, you see uh, uh, the, the daughter of President Trump, Ivanka Trump, standing next to Steve Mnuchin at the official opening of the U.S. Embassy in Trump Jerusalem. Her, uh, Both of these taken of at the same time. Emissions. Were protesters there aware of what was going on in Jerusalem? And what's the connection between those two events? Well, certainly, uh, today's protest was called uh, be, to coincide with the opening of the uh, U.S. Embassy uh, in Jerusalem. The protesters were not following what was going on in Jerusalem. They, they probably didn't see the, you know, hear the speeches and see, see the grand pomp of the inauguration, but they were angry at it uh, very much. Anyone you ask would tell you, I'm here because of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem is our capital of a future Palestinian state that is, ask any Palestinian, they would tell you that whether they're in Gaza or in the occupied West Bank or indeed in Jerusalem and even those living inside the Israeli, inside Israel. So everybody was aware of the fact that this was happening, but no one could was seeing or watching uh, television or, or you know listening to what was unfolding over there. Us journalists, we were, you know, uh, me and Stephanie Decker, my colleague, we both had the audio return mm -hmm. at least of what was happening mm -hmm. in uh, Jerusalem. And I have to say that we discussed it later this evening, and Stephanie even reported on that. It, it was very difficult to take in because on one hand, uh, in one ear, we were listening to all these uh, speeches that we heard the, I think it was the American ambassador saying that this was a great opportunity for peace. Uh, you know, we heard all these remarks. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, we were watching uh, young people being shot at. I mean, they, they were throwing stones, uh, they were burning tires, they were flying tires. Some of them had petrol bombs, but at no point did any was any soldier in danger. Uh, even those who managed to reach the fence and went there to cut it, uh, to breach it, they, when they come back, they tell you, we know we can't get further, but that just doing that for them, symbolizes a sort of sense, momentarily sense of freedom. That's what actually was how one young boy, a teenager, 15 year old, uh, put it for me. Um, so it was quite surreal and you could see this is such a divided uh, part of the world. Mm -hmm. And with every day that passes, you just don't know how they will ever come together, if that will ever happen. And then, you know, there's a rhetoric coming out that this is all organized by Hamas, uh, that the two million Gazans are basically all terrorists. This is completely dehumanizing uh, all these people, uh, completely brushing aside the fact that you have at least two generations who have grown up under a blockade, who have seen nothing else but Gaza since they were born and don't know when they will see anything Welcome else. Uh, that you have more than half Facebook. of the youth, even the university graduates, who are completely unemployed with no chance of getting a job. That you have people who actually have sold already all their furniture at home and have nothing more to feed their children. Right. That is what is happening at the border. It is not Hamas. You hear a lot of people complaining about Hamas. That's not what's pushing them to the border. Hamas, yes, has its rhetoric. Hamas, yes, has its own agenda. But Gazans, by and large, are fed up 
with all political faction at this stage. Right. Hoda, I, I want to end with this tweet here from Musi, who says, the U.S. administration must take responsibility for the killings. The U.S. government has been acting as a mediator between Palestinians and Israelis. The Donald Trump administration jeopardizing is jeopardizing the peace process. The whole world should condemn Israeli aggression and stand with Palestine. Just one view from our community. We're going to let you go, Hoda. Stay safe. We'll continue to follow this story from on the ground. Thank you for being with us. Dr. Marty, which one is better for my dog? Wet dog food or raw beef? This is a bag of premium or... So what can a poet express about the plight of Palestinians? Palestinian poets have long used their creative skills to highlight experiences of dispossession, exile, living under occupation, and the resilience of their people. Today, we'll hear more about the role poetry plays in Palestinian resistance. With us are three poets in London, Rafif Ziada, a poet, human rights activist, and third-generation Palestinian refugee. She's released two albums of spoken word poetry titled We Teach Life and Hadil. In Columbia, Missouri, Iftisan Barakat, in addition to writing poetry, she is the author of two award-winning memoirs about growing up in Palestine, Tasting the Sky, A Palestinian Childhood, and Balcony on the Moon, Coming of Age in Palestine. And in Atlanta, Georgia, Mohammed al Kurd, he is a university student and poet from occupied East Jerusalem. Welcome to the stream, everyone. Rafif, I want to start with you. You heard what Huda had to say at the top of the show. As a Palestinian poet, who writes about resistance. How do you make sense of the resistance and then the reaction that we've seen along the Gaza-Israel border? Well, today has been a really devastating day. Uh, we've just been watching the death toll rise. I think people in Gaza are so courageously saying enough is enough. Uh, we deserve to live in freedom. We deserve to live in dignity. And importantly, we deserve to go back home. The majority of the population in Gaza, as you know, are refugees. Um, and the point of this march is not just against the siege, but it's also to speak of the right of return. That is something very dear to my heart as a third generation Palestinian refugee, something that I speak about quite often. I think what today really brought out is the fact that the Palestinian Nakba is ongoing. Since its inception, Israel has been displacing Palestinians and continues to displace them. The big question on my mind is, what is the international community going to do and how far does Israel have to go? Today, we witnessed a televised massacre of unarmed civilians being shot at. How long does this have to happen before more countries do what South Africa has just done and pull their ambassadors and before we have military embargoes on Israel? Mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying there. If to some, I could see you having a really, you know, a visceral and, and visible reaction to the scenes that we're seeing that we saw from earlier today. Um, and I know that this is difficult for so many of our viewers and, of course, including our guests who are tied to this issue uh, so intimately. What's going through your mind? Mm -hmm. You know, there are certain things that um, cannot be expressed in words. They're just so... Um, language hasn't caught up with what um, the Palestinians go through. Language hasn't developed enough to express the depth of the loss and the, the devastation on the inside and what must be said for the Palestinian to communicate to the world and be heard. So far, we communicate and we're not heard. So uh, for me, there's a, there's the Nakba, of course, which has been going on for 70 years and one day. And uh, that's a geographic and a national and a political and uh, a life Nakba. But there's also an emotional Nakba as well that is happening with all of the Palestinians all over the world. And we don't have a place to express it. Poetry is just a tiny oasis where we can express some of that Nakba and have an opportunity to heal. And um, with tears, I'm reminded of my humanity and that I'm alive and I connect with my people who are in Gaza crying right now. I doubt it that anyone in Gaza is not crying. Mm. 
Now, of course, you mentioned the Nakba for our audience that is not familiar, although if you watch Al Jazeera, you are familiar. Uh, that Nakba. is uh, the day that Palestinians refer to as the catastrophe, literally. Uh, and this is when uh, seven, more than 750,000 Palestinians were forcibly uh, made to flee to do uh, the exodus uh, out of their land. It's like actually 500 villages and towns were emptied and massacres were committed in order to force people to flee. So like a whole country, we're talking about, it's not, actually the the figure 750,000, this is a, a very conservative estimate of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. But what happened is an entire country was emptied eventually for Palestine to be removed from the map and Israel to be put on the map. A whole people have been displaced, a whole country has been destroyed. And in this, in the before and after, what might have happened? other than ethnic cleansing and genocide and destruction. I mean, how could a country be taken off the map, another put on the map? You can only imagine what happened in between, and you can understand it from what's happening in Gaza right now. It's just the same thing. Yeah. Uh, people being, yes, destroyed families, uh, destroyed uh, whole cities, burned. And in my opinion, which I really like to communicate to all of my audiences, that I cannot see the Palestinian experience in separation from the Holocaust. The Palestinian experience happened right after the Holocaust in order to move people outside of Europe and give them a national home. Basically, the Holocaust has moved land, it moved language, it moved hands, but it continues. A people were facing genocide in Europe, and now a people facing genocide in Palestine with the same forces play at play, actually, the Europeans, the United States, and the Jewish people. And it's just it changed places. And that is the larger perspective I like to communicate because we're part of humanity and often we're separated from, from humanity. Like, okay, this is the problem of the Palestinian. No, this is not the problem of the Palestinian. This is the problem of humanity mm. that created a genocide against the Jews and now supports, allows, and waits for 70 years before something happens. They waited for 6 million Jews to die before that, and now 70 years and one day, the waiting happening. And my question is, until when the waiting will continue? Until when? Mm. It does sound powerful words. I, I want to share this tweet from Nura Arakat, who writes, there is a massacre in Gaza today. That is its own headline. Not a spectacle to complete your stories on the embassy move in Jerusalem. For Palestinians, this is all an ongoing Nakba. Not the end, the beginning, or the middle of a farcical peace process. So, Mohammed, I, I want to turn to you with that because there is a special significance for you as well. You were born on the 50th anniversary of the Nakba. Mm -hmm. so, so now that we are reaching the 70th, what significance does this hold for you? How are you marking this anniversary? Um, every every birthday that I've had, and especially today, has been a reminder that the Nakba is not yet nostalgic. It is not yet an opportunity for reminiscing. It's not in a museum. It is ongoing. And today has reminded me that death in Palestine is constant and instant, and it happens like in between breaths. I called my family and I asked them just and I asked to see if they were fine and safe, but nobody can be safe regardless of where you are in Palestine. Now, I I am so moved by the people, the courage of the people in Gaza and how resilient and powerful they have been to to go about such things and to face such things and to be so confrontational with with death just means how much they are lustful for life. Nobody would go face to face to death unless they were so close to it already. And these people have no resources, no freedom. They are living in an open air prison. And the only reason they are erupting this uproar is because they yearn for freedom and dignity and human rights and equality and their right of return. We are done being refugees. We are done being headlines. We are done being statistics. Mm -hmm. But if I know that you are a third generation refugee, and I know you also have uh, written a poem about the Nakba, I'd love if you could share your poem with our audience. Well, actually, um, the poem I had in mind for today was more around the events of today because I saw how various mainstream media were reporting um, and they would just say, Palestinians died as if it just happened, as if Israeli snipers weren't there doing it. Please, go uh, ahead. So it's called a place. Um, is there a place we can be? Is there a place we can be more than thunderclaps and hashtags, 
our fears are not Twitter storms, our flesh not dissected in common sections? Is there a place where we can hold each other in sorrow and silence, in defiance, before you make a picture funeral to share? Is there a place where headlines don't hate us or assume we die mysteriously, just fall, and are never killed intentionally by soldiers taking orders intentionally? by snipers taking aim intentionally, by weapons purchased intentionally, by countries that are selling war intentionally? Is there a place where headlines don't hate us and our life, like our laughter, is intentional? Is there a place I don't have to justify that our lives also matter, that we also love our children? Is there a place where the breaking news, like breaking waves, doesn't just bring more bodies? Is there a place where we can just be human and return? Just a place. Thank you so much, Rafif. That was haunting and beautiful. It, it sparked this comment from Barnaby Jones watching us live on YouTube. He says, this is very similar to the Irish situation. In times of war, they turn to art, poetry, and song to express the pain of being oppressed. If to some, when we talk about poetry, it, it can seem to some as trivial and, and not worthy of a discussion in a day like today. How do you make sense of those two things? And is that the place that you turn to make sense of events like today? It's not trivial at all. Poetry is not trivial. This is how the Arabs survived since the beginning of time. Poetry is the gift of the Arabs since the beginning of time. So uh, poetry elevates and also keeps the human being alive. Generally, at times like this, uh, people shut down. And when a person shuts down, they don't have access to their feeling. When they don't have access to their feeling, they're closer to death. Whether they continue to breathe or not, they're closer to death. When a person continues to breathe through art or through poetry, they're closer to life. They're more able to respond intelligently and creatively. Uh, for instance, I can show you um, since Tarafif just read a poem, I'll show you a little piece of art that I have that inspires me. Please do. It's actually a war piece of art. This is a, uh, an origami tank. It's a paper tank, origami. Uh, actually, an artist, an American artist who uh, went to uh, the war in Iraq uh, creates uh, these tanks. And I got this tank, and uh, he had like a cannon in it. And I put a pencil in it and turned this tank from... Uh, a piece like a, a weapon of destruction to a weapon of creativity. The cannon now in my mind says, I can go on. And the pencil shoots instead of destructive things. It, it, it shoots words that maintain hope. So it's more of like a bird. And instead of the Merkaba, which is like a 60 tons on the ground, uh, killing the ground, this is just a, a few ounces and it can fly. It's so important for me to use my creativity to take the elements of the oppression and turn them in my mind so I can cross them and interact with them. Whether it's poetry, where the language that is uh, targeting us, excluding us, disconnecting us, I can uh, give it more life, I can nurture it and bring it back to life, the language, so it expresses me. Because generally the language is attempting to uh, uh, keep me on the outside. The political language aims to keep me on the outside. The poetic language constantly mm. brings me home to humanity mm. and the rest of the people. But poetry is not enough. There, this is a catastrophe, and and a poem can do some things. Right. I use paper. I use art. I use painting. I use my tears. Mm. Uh, I use relationships. I use everything to stay alive because the occupation has one goal. It's for us not to remain alive, for us to die and disappear, and for only for the land to remain and the land to be taken. It's it's just, just, um, when, you, when you mentioned political language versus poet, poetic language, it, it reminds me of something I'd like to share with our audience before we go. Sure. When we speak of resistance, people might think of images like today's protest, but perhaps another recent case should come to mind as well. And that's of Doreen Tatur, a Palestinian poet convicted this month by Israel for inciting violence and supporting what a court called terrorism. She published a poem on social media titled, Resist My People Resist. And now she's facing up to five years in prison. This is what she told the stream. <laughs> وهي جزء من, جزء لا 
من وقت الاعتقال لحد الان انا جهزت عندي كتاب ديوان شعر كامل جاهز للطباعه والنشر بعد الحكم طبعا يعني انا في الوقت الحالي ممنوع أن انشر لكن ما توقفت بالكتاب لحد قبل اسبوع كتبت قصيده ما في اي شيء راح يمنعني اني استمر في مشروع الكتاب اللي انا بلشت فيها الكتاب لانه هي حياه بالنسبه لي ومنها فتره من حياتي وماركو فاكيد راح اكمل الكتابه وراح وراح انشر كتاباتي بعد بعد مباشره بعد الانتهاء من الحكم محمد we have just about 30 seconds left but i saw you nodding your head there what are you thinking um just to, just to point out that when when Darin was arrested about 400 other people were arrested in 2015 2016 for facebook posts and this is not only a violation of like um, basic human rights of free speech but this also attests to say that there is a narrative here that is being mm -hmm. manipulated Muhammad, I heard I have to stop you there our thanks to you Abtisam Barakat and Rafif Ziada thank you for being here on the show today and the story will of course will continue with hashtag AJ stream we'll see you online wow how wonderful well <clears throat> that was certainly <clears throat> an amazing video. Um, all of the videos we've watched today were the Amnesty International um, program uh, and the interviews with the poets, very profound, very moving. <clears throat> and it should renew, <clears throat> excuse me, it should renew all of us in our uh, dedication to, um, uh, to bring this suffering of the Palestinians to the world, this genocide, this injustice, particularly in America where it's being supported by our tax money. So I thank the people on um, Facebook, uh, Cabria, uh, Gufran, uh, Jajul from India. Uh, and I uh, apologize uh, for my uh, discombobulation sending out the email without the link so that nobody else uh, was able to come on Zoom, but I will make a uh, video of this and uh, send it out uh, to everyone. And uh, again, to my uh, friend, Jill Lynn, who accused me of vitriol, um, I apologize for any vitriol, um, but poetry is passion. Um, and the Palestinian poetry is passion for the survival of their people. So there are strong feelings. There are strong words because of the um, devastating and, and, and murderous, difficult situation that they're in, verified by uh, Amnesty International in their apartheid report. And I uh, urge everyone to look up the apartheid report that Amy Goodman spoke about on the uh, video we just saw uh, to read the full report. Their video was, the uh, excerpts of the video we saw were truly, um, truly uh, disturbing uh, and affirming of uh, all of us who feel that the uh, situation in Palestine is genocide and apartheid and that we support the Palestinian people. So we send our love and support to the Palestinian people, uh, to their poets, to their artists, to their writers, uh, to the children in the prisons. Uh, and we uh, promise and we pledge to do all we can to uh, bring their plight to the attention of humanity and to change it. So thank you for uh, being with me today. Um, on Facebook and on Zoom Palestine. And I'll see you next week. Hopefully I'll remember to put the, po put the Zoom link in my uh, post. Uh, take care, God bless, ma salama, peace, salam, shalom, om shante, namaste, peace to all on our planet. And may we come to grow, to love and appreciate each other. Unity in diversity, diversity in unity. Bye. Masalama.